Okay. I think there'll be a few people still joining. And I'd like to start again by welcoming everyone to our webinar on protein dynamics. My name is Liz Myring. I'm the president of the Protein Society. And it's my true delight and uh, honor to introduce this exciting webinar. I'm going to start with a few announcements uh, before going to the presentations by our speakers today. So this webinar is part of an ongoing series of webinars from the Protein Society that the Protein Society is hosting. Um, and I would just like to invite you all to make suggestions for webinar topics and to consider organizing a webinar yourself. Um, our wonderful staff at the Protein Society make this very easy to do. And you can uh, find information on, on the process for this on the Protein Society webpage and contact either me, Liz Meyering, the president, or Raluca Kedar, our CEO, um, to give your ideas on, on upcoming webinars. And please do stay tuned. We have uh, additional webinars coming up. So I have a couple of other announcements. Let me just go to that to do with the society. Uh, I want to just uh, let you know that we have our next annual symposium taking place in Vancouver next year, the July 23rd to 26th. And uh, you can find information about that as well on our website and the Protein Society website. And for your exciting research, I encourage you to have a look at Protein Science. Our editor-in-chief is John Curian and our impact factor is now at eight. So it's a great place to publish your exciting latest findings. And with that, I'd like to uh, come to our webinar. So I thank you all for being here and I'd like to extend a very warm thanks to Dorothy Kern and uh, Louis Kay, our speakers today. Um, I'll give a bit of background on, on the, uh, our two speakers before turning uh, describing the process for our webinar and uh, um, then turning it over to them. So. Dorothy Kern is a professor of biochemistry at Brandeis University, um, and she's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. She um, has been recognized with many prestigious awards, uh, such as the Pfizer Award in Enzyme Chemistry from the American Chemical Society, the Dayhoff Award. Uh, she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm not going to go through all the awards, but we have uh, real amazing pioneers in protein dynamics giving our presentations today. Her research is on the dynamics of proteins and biophysical analytical techniques to define at atomic resolution how proteins move in time, i.e. their dynamics. And different proteins have very different personalities. And so she's looked at um, enzymes, signaling proteins, and the molecules they affect. And in addition, her research focuses on evolution of the catalytic power of enzymes and complex signaling in higher organisms organisms. So uh, Dorte will be speaking first. Uh, Louis Kay is our second speaker. He's a professor at the University of Toronto and is a Canada Research Chair. Likewise, many been recognized in many, many um, prestigious awards. He uh, has received the Order of Canada. He's a fellow of the Royal Society in Canada and London, Hertzberg Gold Medal, uh, and the Canada Gardner International Award. So that award was for developing new NMR experiments, which have revealed the rates and energetics of proteins accessing invisible states that are functional or dysfunctional. For example, mutant proteins that can cause disease. And his research has also shown how to follow dynamics at high resolution in prote for proteins in cellular-like contexts and in cells and in very large assemblies. So we have a breadth of dynamics being represented today. And uh, we're really excited to, to hear what's happening at the frontier that these two pioneers uh, have created and continue to push forward. So how we're gonna do this is uh, we want to give a sense of the um, breadth of what's going on in dynamics and have a, a real discussion. Uh, so we're going to have the two presentations for Dorothy and then Lewis and then um, have a discussion between them of the issues in the field and, and how to continue to, to forge forward. So what you all can do is type questions in the chat. So if you look at your webinar um, 
sorry, at your Zoom setting, you can see the question and answer uh, tab. And you can put your questions there at any time throughout the, this whole webinar. And uh, we will see them. So Dorothy and Lewis will see them, I will see them, and our staff will see them. And uh, at the end, we'll uh, address those questions and have a real discussion, a live discussion on, on, the, on these issues. So without any further ado, I'd also like to thank again, Dorothy and Lewis for being here and I'll turn it over to Dorothy. Okay, I see your screen, Dora. All right, so welcome everybody. I'm very excited. I would prefer to do it in person, but then you wouldn't have as many together in one place to uh, really discuss things about protein dynamics. And so I'm excited that a lot of people dialed in, that they are sharing our enthusiasm and passion for that. What I want to do is ask the question, why can we not design rationally good drugs or enzymes today? The structural biology community has been really... Um, amazing of solving high resolution crystal structures. And now these days we don't even have to solve them anymore. We just can ask alpha folk and they spit it out. So why can we not design a function? For biological function, proteins don't sit, and that's my energy landscape here, in the low energy state, but they have to traverse the energy landscape via transition states to high energy states. And these are the states which we can really easily figure out. So what I want to talk about is why protein dynamics is essential for biological function. We see the like, enzyme wiggling here and about methods, how we can actually uh, get to those invisible states. So why do I play dancing in the dark? Because we can't see individual atoms at, uh, at full resolution how they are, how they're moving. So what we do in my lab is combining all these experimental methods. And of course, one emphasis will be my bread and butter NMR spectroscopy together with massive computation, whether it's um, MD simulations, um, you know, evolutionary bioinformatics or now AI methods to finally arrive at, at, at these movies. So I thought in the beginning, I'm going to give you a little timeline and kind of the vision I had when I was an undergrad. So this was my vision to be able to make real-time movies as protein in action, because that's actually how those biological molecules function. And I want to show you how we are getting closer to that, actually, to, to be able to feel, really do that. On the top, you see kind of really the big stones and the evolution from structure to function, which means dynamics. And you're all very familiar with these milestones, but these are really very influential to me. And uh, on the bottom is kind of things we did my little lab with my really talented grad students and postdocs, where we started, you know, now more than 20 years ago to actually see that protein dynamics is essential for signaling. So here's a little signaling protein, the first signaling domain where we actually found an interconverse between the inactive and active states. Then we showed that protein dynamics is absolutely essential and dictates um, catalysis for enzymes. I'm going to talk about the combination of different methods. So in 2009, um, we figured out how to even look at dynamics in the crystal, uh, in, uh, together with my close friend, Tom Albor, where we looked at conformational substrates at room temperature directly uh, in, in the crystal. And of course, now more and more people are using death masses to do ensemble refinements. Then we were able to look at drug transports about through membranes in real time by NMR spectroscopy. Um, people always challenged me, but what do you want to do with these wiggling proteins? So in 2014, we, for the first time, demonstrated that protein dynamics is actually essential for a rational drug design. Um, we then reconstructed the evolution of proteins, the dynamic features of proteins from three, three billion years back to today. Uh, and so these later things I'm going to talk, touch on really on in this talk, how we can now visualize 
transition states come from conformational transitions, how we can figure out why directed evolution makes enzymes better. And I'm going to talk about methods, how we can now look at, at very accurate atomic resolution at high energy state, NAC states and transition states. And the very last one, which is still unpublished, is whether we can now actually predict even those structures with AI. So that's a little, little timeline of our steps going towards this reality here. All right, so let me introduce um, one of our systems. And by the way, you should think about your favorite system because I want to convey some general principles and general principles hopefully apply to your favorite proteins. So we will look at, at, a, an, at an enzyme during catalysis and what shows unlike kinase because it's a fully essential agon or, um, um, enzyme in every organism. Um, so every organism, every cell needs it because it catalyzes the fully reversible interconversion between ATP and AMP to two ADP molecules, thereby maintaining the, the right nucleotide concentrations. This, this re reaction would take 7,000 years. And now you see why I got so excited already as an undergrad about enzymes, this catalytic power, the enzyme can do it in milliseconds. And in order to understand how this enzyme can do it, we got to actually figure out the entire free energy landscape. When we started the project, we had the crystal structure of the APO protein in this open form. Now, the next crystal structure we had when the substrates were bound and what you can see that those two lids closed up now phosphor transfer happens. But in order to figure out the enzyme, we need to know all these other things, the red stuff we didn't know, which means what are the rates of interconversion? How, how do the transition states look like? Because they dictate the, 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 the speed of the reaction. And we also couldn't figure out high, high energy states, in this case, one which is only populated to a few states, a uh, two percentage. So how do we get to those? Of course, NMR is one very, very powerful technique because what we can look at is at atomic resolution, under physiological condition, while this enzyme doing its reaction, uh, we can figure out everything, structure and dynamics over the basically the entire um, um, time range. We just have to go into a toolbox of NMR and find the right method. So what do we do? We take our little enzyme, we stick it in the NMR tube, and as soon as we give the substrate, it runs through this enzymatic cycle. And while it's running through the enzymatic cycle, we can measure everything, populations, rates, and structure of those interconverting species by these very powerful NMR relaxation dispersion experiments. So don't worry too much about it. What you For the physicists, I have the equation here. So you can see that we can fit these relaxation times as a function of an external field strength. And what we, we can get out of that, that's important for the major of the audience, populations, rate of interconversion and structure. And we can do that on every single atom. So when we did this during, on this enzyme during catalysis, what we found out is that we are measuring actually the closing and the opening of this protein. And it says opening the protein, which is a rate limiting step for this enzyme, because that rate coincides how fast this enzyme makes ATP. This was a first surprise because people had, had proposed that the chemical step, the phosphor transfer step of this enzyme is rate limiting. And what we see this often now that the rate limiting step for enzymes is actually not the chemical step which the enzyme is catalyzing, but rather a conformational change. So I show you the little movie. So it's this opening, which is actually dictating the speed of this enzyme. So now we wanted to find out how this enzyme became so efficient. And so for that, we ask our first evolutionary question, how did, how did enzymes evolve from 3 billion years ago when life just arose all the way to today? If you ask an evolutionary question, you have to have a strong evolutionary driver. And you might ask the question, where is the energy coming from for this wiggling of the proteins, the protein dynamics? It's actually temperature, it's KT. And now you see why I think temperature is one of the biggest evolutionary drivers. Because when life arose, our Earth was basically a volcano. So we had a lot of energy. And the enzymes had to evolve to now be efficient with much less energy in the environment. So that was a question we asked. And two very talented grad students, me and Chris, took on this question. So we have our question. Now, how do we do that? We're doing this by using all the modern sequences, which are known, and then first 
calculate the phylogenetic tree, which I'm sure all of you have done on your, on your protein systems. But then in the second step, we calculate for these non-existing ancestral proteins, what is the probability of their amino acid sequence? And that's called ancestral sequence reconstruction. So we reconstruct those sequences and then we make them in the lab and we express, purify, and characterize. So you basically reconstruct in the test tube the evolution over three billion years. And so the first thing we, we looked at is what those enzymes do. And so the first thing I show you is actually the melting temperature. And indeed, the, the melting temperature is actually shown in these arrow in, in, the, in these numbers. What we see that the melting temperature, the thermal stability from the old ancestors, which is really highly thermal stable, right? The melting temperature of 90 degrees, over time very nicely follows the sea temperature on Earth. And what you see here, even a billion years ago, I don't know whether you know, but 95% of the pop, uh, of the species got extinct because the, the earth froze over. It's called the snowball effect. And we have our lowest um, um, melting temperature for this ancestor. And we figured out why they are thermostable stable and so on. But the, the bigger question is, how about activity, right? So I told you back then we had a lot of temp and temperature, uh, meaning energy. So the oldest ancestor instead was very little active at low temperature because it was high temperature and had more activity at, at high temperature. And of course, when finally activity drops down with higher temperature, it's because it's protein denatures. So did evolution work? Yes. As Earth cooled down, we see indeed the evolutionary pressure, the enzyme has to become more active at low temperature because that's where the organisms now live. So by what we saw that this, this ancestor did not lose its thermal stability. So that's why I call it a super enzyme because it has is very active and very thermal stable. But what happens over time? What happens over time, and this is what they call active pressure. The creatures, creatures could not survive without an increase in activity. But what happens over time, and I call that passive drift, the enzyme will lose its thermal stability, but that is slower because there is no disadvantage to be thermal stable, but there's also no advantage to be thermal stable because as the, the earth cools down, it doesn't have to be thermal stable at 90 degrees anymore. So what you see is how in evolution, active pressure versus passive drift works. Active pressure is fast because that means survival, whereas this passive drift is just slowly losing a function which doesn't give you an advantage or disadvantage anymore. All right, let's take a break. So figuring out that enzymes in evolution had to work, otherwise we all not, would not be living today. Having figured out now that evolution took care of it, the question is how? How did the enzyme become faster? And if you ask the question about speed, we actually have to look at the summit, the transition state. The transition state, we cannot see in the crystal structure. We definitely cannot see it in the EM structure on any of those or NM stru X, NMR structures because it's not populated. It's maybe 10 to the power minus 25 populated. So how can we spy at this? Because it's dictating how fast the reaction goes. That tells you just the kind of determination. Macroscopically, we can just turn on the, uh, the TV. A 400 meter track of snow. So we see our, our little daughter here at the Olympics going over the mountain. Like this. She's looking good. Again, she's number four. But microscopically, we can't just turn on the TV. But what we can do is computation. So I show you here a targeted molecular atom dynamic simulation. Remember, we have the closed structure, we have the open structure. And so we're just going to actually, by MD simulation, follow that opening. The dilemma is that we don't know where, where along this pathway is the, the maximum of the energy landscape, meaning the transition state. How can we get there? There's one thing we can experimentally measure, and that is how fast the reaction go, a rate constant. So this spies indirectly on the transition state. So I had this crazy idea to measure the pressure dependence of this rate of, of, of opening and why pressure dependence. If we measure the pressure of the rate, we get actually the partial more volume of the transition state with the, the unknown relative to the closed state. Now I told you, I want to give you a high, highly structural information, atomic resolution structure of the transition state. And now I just give you volume like a blob. 
So we needed a second trick. The second trick is we're going to compare two homologous proteins, one from E. coli, which lives under ambient pressure, and the second, you're going to now dive down in the deep ocean with me and find an enzyme which lives at under high pressure 10 kilometers down in the ocean. So we call that piezophile. And by using this trick of the homologous proteins, we were able to figure out at atomic resolution the transition state ensemble. Okay, so now the third thing is you have to hire some really smart grad students. So Jordan and John took on that project. So now, remember what we want to measure are these relaxation dispersion experiments of this enzyme during catalysis, which gives us the rate of this opening. But we want to do it as a function of pressure. And you see the high quality of the data. So this is a piezophile, that's a mesophile, all the way up to 1500 bar. And from these fits, we can see that the mesophilic protein, which doesn't live under pressure, couldn't care less about pressure. The rates really doesn't change with, 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 with pressure. In stark contrast, the piezoli, piezophile, which lives under pressure, right, in the ocean, is very slow at ambient pressure, but gets much, much faster under pressure. What does it mean if a reaction gets faster with pressure? It favors small volumes. So what it means is that our transition state volume is actually smaller than the ground state. And we can accurately calculate it's about 35 mils per mole. So now you, would, you have to ask the question, what defines the volume of a protein? It turns out you can barely squeeze a protein. But what the biggest difference is, is water molecules solvating charged residues. And from old fundamental work, we know that about what solvation of one charged residues gives about 10 mils per mole. So now you know where we are going. We boldly predicted that the piezophile will expose three to four charges in the transition state, which becomes solvated, whereas the mesophile does not. So we can go back to our TMD simulations and ask the question, where along the pathway do we see that solvation coming in in the piece of file? So now I have to kind of unfreeze this or first zoom in. So what you're seeing here is the opening of the protein and these little balls are actually individual water molecules. So the other power of MD simulation is that you can actually visualize individual water, water molecules. And what you see early on that we become, that this interface becomes solvated. And I freeze here right where we think the transition state ensemble is. Because in the piezophile, we get solvation of those charged residues, whereas in the mesophile, we do not. And why do we not get the solvation in the mesophile? Because we have those salt bridges. And it turns out the salt bridges are broken in the piezophile by just three mutations in this interface, which are highlighted in red, becoming these residues in blue. So we started with experiments to figure out in the computation where the transition state example is. Now, the cool thing with computation is you can go back and design an experiment to test it. And it's pretty simple, right, how you would test it. If that is a transition state ensemble, if you put those three blue residues into the entire background of the mesophile, the E. coli protein, it should become pressure dependent. That's the test of our prediction of the transition state ensemble. And that's what we exactly found. Here is my triple mutant in the background of the E. coli, and it is as pressure dependent as the entire piezophile. So with this iterative approach, we could bracket, shown over here, that where well, about the transition state ensemble is with these experiments. And it's very early in the opening. And interestingly, it's actually different to all the prediction or, or the papers which they proposed in the literature uh, from pure MD simulations and in quantum mechanical com calculation, emphasizing the importance of combining computation with NMR experiments. Okay, so this was our starting point. Now we have a we have an atomic structure of the transition state ensemble. What we still don't have is this high energy state which lives on, they are only to about 12, uh, 10%. We know the rate of interconversions from these dispersion experiments. We know the populations, but from these dispersion experiments, we only get chemical shift of this minor state. And chemical shift is 
to date, hopefully soon, not anymore, but to date, not accurate enough to calculate high resolution structures. So how can we get to this elusive state? Before I ask the question is, why do we care about these high energy states, which are there to maybe 1%? It turns out that in many cases, it's that high energy state, which is the biological active state. In this case, for enzyme catalysis, but in other cases, it's for ligand binding, drug binding, protein-protein interactions. So very often, it's not the, the low energy state, which is reactive, but this high energy state. So there is a big desire to, to develop methods to get to this elusive high, high energy state. So again, my superhero, John, took on that next project. What's the idea? I told you chemical shift in NMR is not accurate enough, but what is accurate enough to, to actually calculate high resolution structures is pseudo-contact shifts. What is a pseudo-contact shift? If you put a paramagnetic metal into a protein, in this case, we just replaced uh, zinc, which is usually bound there, by a paramagnetic cobalt, it will create a magnetic tensor. And every atom in this protein will feel this magnetic tensor in a distance, here's my distance, and angle dependence. So in other words, we can calculate from this pseudo-contact shift which we can easily measure in an HSPC in a two-dimensional spectrum, which takes two hours. The angle and distance from every atom in the protein relative to this paramagnet. So of course, if you have that, you solve a, you solve a, a, a structure. And that was really developed by uh, many, many years ago um, um, uh, in Italy, this method. And was was used for static structures. But we want to use this now to uses pseudo contact shift information to get this high energy structure. So how can we do that? So here's my, my data, right? So we are having this enzyme doing catalysis and what you can see, the paramagnetic metal induces pseudo contact shifts, upfield or downfield shifted of, on basically every single residue. So we have a lot of data. The dilemma is this is population averaged over the structure we do know and the high energy state we don't know. And it's population average, so it's dominated by that known structure. So how can we get this elusive high energy state? We get that by doing the relaxation dispersion experiments again with these paramagnets. And the difference between the, 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 the relaxation dispersion between the paramagnetic protein and the diamagnetic protein gives us the pseudo contact shifts of our invisible state. So we did it. And for the first time, I would were able to solve to a very high, high accuracy an NMR solution structure of this high energy state. You would ask the question, where is it? Red is fully closed. Yellow is fully open. Dark uh, blue is closed. That is fully open. It's about 30% open in respect to the AMP lid and about 50% open as ATP lid uh, relative to the AMP lid. Why do we care about this high energy state? If you look at the fully closed structure over here, you wouldn't even see the substrate. So in other words, substrate could never bind and product could never go out. So what we have is, is this partial opening or in, first in the partial closing so that substrate can bind. Then we fully close to do chemistry. Then we partially open to finally uh, get the products released. So this partially closed state is essential for the catalytic cycle. Now you were thinking about your favorite enzyme, it says, or your favorite protein, it says, but I don't have a metal binding site. How can we make this method general applicable for, for any protein? For this, we teamed up with Daniel Heuser in Basel, who developed these um, Lanternite tags, so these are these cages where you can put in lanternites, diamagnetic and paramagnetic, and then this disulfide bridging, you can just put it on the protein of interest wherever you want it. So what I show you here that we were able to do that of a full-length human SARC kinase, where the minor state is actually this, is, is this, this is open state, and this is very, very well um, calculated by these pseudo-context shift um, 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 pseudo, um, relaxation dispersion experiments. So we can do this for these large conformational changes where we go from the closed state where these domains are closed to open. And now 
Galapu in the lab is applying that for a membrane protein where we now put the paramagnetic uh, spy um, um, uh, tag in the membrane. And what you can see here between the diamagnetic and paramagnetic um, um, tag, we see beautiful pseudo song text shifts. So we're doing these methods even in membrane proteins. So stay tuned. Now, these are beautiful experiments, but they're still pretty time consuming. So in the time of AI, wouldn't it be great if we could just ask the computer to compute those high energy states? So that was right away when AlphaFold came, came up, I said, could we go the next step and not just calculate one structure, but structural ensembles? So can we get these to these higher energy states, which are still minimums in the energy landscape, or just higher populated, lower populated by AI? So I'm going to give a little tour. I call it evolution at play from primordial circadian risen to AI um, a predicted conformational substates. And the reason why I, I show you this little day and night movie uh, from Julia is because we used a circadian protein, which is a metamorphic protein, which jumps between those two structures as our first test systems. So we have this protein, which coexists between two different structures and alpha fold only predicts one structure. And it's a big, I mean, it's a big conformational change, right? That's why I wanted to use this. You see, that strand becomes a helix. This strand becomes a helix. This helix becomes a strand. This helix becomes a strand. You're completely switching secondary structure elements between the two conformations. Where is the protein coming from? As I said, it's one of the two essential players for circadian resin. So I'm not going to give you details about it. You can read it up uh, in this. In, uh, they just got recently published. But our little protein over here, together, with this massive big protein of a kinase phosphatase is doing a, a, a circadian risen. And a circadian risen is phosphorylation dephosphorylation, what I see on the gels here. So you, you go from non-phosphorylated to single double phosphorylated and then to non-phosphorylated. And we have all the structures uh, and so on. But I want to just tell you where this little guy comes from because binding of this little guy to this kinase phosphatase is essential for the circadian risen. Okay. Okay. Where's the start? Again, hire a completely very, very smart postdoc. So this is all work, um, the computational part from Hannah, which is fantastic. So she took on this challenging project. And what was the idea? How can we get from alpha fold predictions one structure to actually getting both? It's going back to evolution again. So the idea we had is proteins evolved for function. What we do in alpha fold, we put all the multiple sequence alignments, all the sequences into one bucket. How about we cluster them based on their, their, their evolution, which means sequence similarity. So what Hannah came up with is a method where we are clustering now the sequences based on their sequence similarity. So here we have about 50 clusters and then we use each cluster to predict by alpha fold what the structure is. And the outcome is shown over here. So we call this AF cluster. And what you see is very, very exciting. Hannah found that she has two minima, meaning two structures which are, which are um, predicted with high confidence. One, which is a ground state, and the other one, which is a false fit state exactly the two structures which we know experimentally. So we, we got, we cracked it, okay? You said it's the answer, right? But H Hannah is very curious and asked the question, why is our AF cluster working? So remember the prediction was it's in the evolution. So she looked at our evolutionary tree and sure enough found that certain chi Bs in this phylogenetic tree favors the fault switch states and others favor the ground states. And that's why we can predict both structures. Now going back, can we actually test that this prediction is correct? For almost all of them, nobody knows the, 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 the favorable structures. So we chose one over here from a creature from this T. elongatus vesticus, where nobody knows what the probability is in which strait, and tested that by NMR. The prediction is this one is actually favoring the opposite state, the fault stage state. So she teamed up 
there's a rotation student who now joined my lab, Julia, and ended up with a, a postdoc, a new postdoc in my lab, and I used NMR to experimentally test this AI method. And indeed, what they found that the, the ground state is now disfavored and the full switch state, because it's not, it's about 80%, right? The, 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 large, the large population in the NMR uh, spectrum is a full switch state. So you can very quickly actually figure out whether you have the full switch state or ground state, remember, because we're switching helices and strands. So you can use the C alpha and C beta chemical shifts to calculate whether you're on a strand or a helix. So in a couple of weeks, those, the, those girls found out that we are favoring the false switch state. They also went ahead and solved the NMR structure just uh, for sanity. Now we went one step further. One thing all the companies ask always, can we predict disease causing mutations, how it's altering the energy landscape? And of course, most of you have done it. You take it, you take your protein, you make that point mutation, alpha fold gives you the same structure. So can we use our AF cluster methods to now also predict the relative populations of those states and what mutations to, the, to, the, to, the, to these populations? So Hannah used all the sequences on her AF cluster to figure out on top which amino acids are favoring the fault switch state and which amino acids are favoring the ground state and came up with three mutations out of this data analysis where she purely predicted that our vial type protein, which sits 80% in the ground state, will be flipped with just three mutations over here to the to the to the false switched one. Exactly the question everybody wants to ask, right? Can we predict what, what point mutations do? Now we did the NMR, and sure enough, we found, and that was an exciting day, that we switched the populations. So you can see here, right? the fault switches the little guy becomes a big one and vice versa so just from the relative populations of the of of the of the spec of the spectra of the peaks we can see that we flip the populations and then of course you can assign it and you see that the major state here's strand strand helix is the fault switch state now does it only work for chi b um hannah was able to show that this transcription factor which also li which lives in these two alternate fault switch states can be predicted very accurately uh, with her methods. And now she could go into the database and look at more than 100 protein fam families to now ask the question, can we predict alternate states where there is no crystal structure and nothing knows? And it's very exciting. She found this oxidoreductase from tuberculosis, only that crystal structure is known. And we are predicting these alternate states, which are, we are now testing by NMR. So in the last uh, 10 minutes, I want to um, ask the question of applications. Can we use these methods to um, either make better medicine or better, better enzymes? So let's start first to ask the question of drugs. So we, we ask the question, why can we not design highly efficient drugs? So these are protein kinases. We have about 500 protein kinases in our body. Most structures are solved, yet it's very hard to make selective drugs because the ATP binding site is highly conserved. So if you make one into the active site, in most uh, inhibitors which are used, they are not selective. They are also inhibiting other kinases. So since we are too stupid to actually design anything, I asked the question, can we ask what in the success story, which was actually found by kind of accident. So Gleevec is one of the best drugs uh, on the market. And it was a puzzle for 20 years why it's so selective. It binds able kinase, the cancer target, by 10 nanomolar, and a very close kinase, saw kinase, 3,000 fold different, uh, weaker. The puzzle was beautiful structures solved by the curing lab showed that the binding pocket is basically identical except one, one residue. And if you change this residue, it, it's not changing that this become a tighter binder. So we had a good, good example. Again, NMR came, came handy. And we used NMR to do a drug titration. So we have our APO protein, and then we titrate in increasing amounts of drug. And what we saw is, was a disappearance, the shift, the disappearance of the APO peak and a reappearance of a new peak. So if you have 
a disappearance, a shift of the peak, and a, a reappearing of a new peak. What it means that you actually need two processes, one which is fast on the NMR time scale, and the other one which is actually slow on the NMR time scale. Okay. So now we can draw four different possible mechanisms, right? So we have two processes. Either we bind the drug first, and then we do a conformational change, which is called induced fit step, or we are doing a conformational change first, and then we bind the drug, which is called conformation selection. Now, since we have one fast, one slow process, we have four possibilities. So you can just simulate theoretically the line shape for this titration and then compare to your data. And we found something very exciting. We found actually a mechanism I didn't think was favorable, which is an induced fit step. So what it means is we get a fast binding of the drug followed by a slow conformational change. And again, these NMR experiments took two days, very quick. Now, in order to quantify conformational, uh, uh, all these rate conference, right, where we have a conformational selection, a binding step, and then this induced fit step, which is protein dynamics, in the drug bound state, we turned to fluorescence stop flow kinetics and it better shows us the same kinetics. So we see a by, um, we see we is fast binding followed by a slow induced fit step. Great, we get, can, can get the rate constants. And if you go reverse, you see the dissociation. Dissociation actually doesn't mean, that doesn't measure that this physical dissociation step. It actually measures this slow conformational change within the drug bound state. And here now is the answer why Gleevec is selective for ABLE. Because this protein dynamics in the drug bound state is so vastly different. This rate is three orders of magnitude slower for the tight binder, which gives us a 4,000 fold shift in equilibrium of that uh, in, in this direction. And that gives you the nanomolar affinity. Because what's really important to, to look at here is that the overall affinity of the drug is a product of these three equilibrium constants. So by definition, an induced fit step shifts the conform shifts a micromolar binder right away into a nanomolar binder because you multiply that by four order of magnitude. So this is really why protein dynamics is so essential uh, for making highly selective drugs. Now, where else? can we go? I think it's even better to go to allosteric drugs because the reason we have 500 kinase is because of differential allosteric regulation. So the allosteric sites, which are not the active site, are actually the selective ones, okay? So we have higher selectivities and we can also act, um, develop activators. So the, we used another kinase where we knew it's hopping between the active and inactive state over here, okay? And we wanted to find allosteric modulator, which binds to this allosteric site where usually the natural activator TPX2 binds right over here. So we have that co-crystal structure. And that was really great teamwork by a bigger team here. So again, we wanted to find things which bind there. And rather than making small molecules, we screened for monobodies, small proteins, which can bind there. And that was a good day because we found one monobody, the green guy, which activates the, the protein, the kinase, more than the natural the natural activator. And we found a bunch of them which inhibit the kinase to a various amounts, which are these inhibiting motor bodies. And all they do is shift this equilibrium. All right, so we are in your work. That's why I wanted to introduce the orthosteric drugs first, the allosteric drugs second, can we combine them? And why would you do that? We call it double drugging. So we want to combine inhibitor, which binds to the active side, to a second inhibitor, which binds to this allosteric side. And the reason is majorly because the biggest problem in, 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 in cancer treatment is development of drug resistance. And if we drug these two drugs at the same time, you're multiplying the pro probabilities it's a, so a multiplication that we have two mutants happening at the same time. And so this method would actually really overcome this big hurdle of, of drug resistance. And of course, the other advantage is you have additive effects, you get an improved, uh, 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 improved um, inhibition. So Hannes and Chensik solved that crystal structure of the double drug kinase, great. Then showed positive and negative cooperativity 
And of course, you understand parts of cooperativity, right? If you have an active site drug which prefers to bind to the inactive conformation, you're shifting this equilibrium, and therefore the, the inhibiting monobottle, which also has a high affinity to this, to this, to this state, will bind tighter. And so what you see that indeed positive cooperativity to this default, positive cooperativity, if you combine the active site inhibitor with this, 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 this inhibiting monobody. Of course, negative cooperativity if you take the activating monobody. But the big effect is really on activity. The enzyme doesn't really care about cooperativity. It cares about how much the, the, the cancel cell actually cares about how much residual activity we have in the cell. And here comes the big effect. If you ask the question, how much of the Danuso tip, the, which is the, you know, the, the drug which is used on the market, the, the orthospheric drug is needed to give, to get 90% inhibition in the presence of these inhibited monobodies, what you see, you need 20 fold less because each drug knocks down the activity. And that is a, a big effect. So just to tell you, um, this is proof of concept stuff. We did a little brand eyes. And so I started two biotech companies, really and Mama Therapeutics. And now I can't tell you any details, but of course, what is what is uh, already uh, um, in the public database is that these that this approach of using allosteric and orthosteric drugs um, works like charm, taking advantage of differential protein dynamics to to cure the cancer patients. So the last two minutes, just a little flare because we want to go to Lewis. Um, second application can we make better enzymes? And so we, again, are too stupid to make it. So I asked the question, can we ask why if designer enzymes, which are really slow, become much better with directed evolution? So we want to compare a slow enzyme to an, an evolved enzyme and ask the question, how did directed evolution make an enzyme much faster? So this was a great collaboration with Don Hilbert and, um, and, and Adrian and my two postdocs, Ricardo and Rene. All you need to know is that this is the reaction and all we need is a protonated base and a non-protonated base here to open that ring. And we have a great transition state analog, okay? So here's my transition state analog. The design of the enzyme is in blue. It's very slow and directed evolution, which was done in the Hilbert lab in 2013, makes this enzyme two orders of magnitude faster. The crystal structure said, okay, my unprotonated base is perfectly aligned, but the designer one is not really, the, the, the lysine doesn't really talk to the transition state. And this glutamine is doing it. So I looked at it as that, I don't think we need these 17 mutations, right? This, the directed evolution put in 17 mutations. I thought we just need this glutamine. So we put this glutamine in the designer enzyme. That crystal structure is dead on to the fully designed enzyme, which is fully active. And we thought, okay, that should be a fully active enzyme, except it did not improve, improve the designer enzyme. So it looks like the, the crystal structure is misleading us. So where's NMR coming in? We go into NMR and we look at the NMR spectra. And what we see that the designer enzyme actually has two structures, two populations. And I'm calling that second one inactive because we know now going to crystallography that this designer and actor enzyme really has two conformations, the dark blue and the light blue. So we see again, conformational heterogeneity within the crystal. And you see that the dark blue would be clashing with our substrate. And what directed evolution does, it minimizes this inactive conformation. So the first principle by directed evolution, it's increasing the population of this active state. The dilemma is, this shift in population just gives us a 2.5 increase in activity. Where's the other 50 fold coming from? And the other 50 fold comes from the physical chemical step. And for the physical chemistry step, we get to look at the transition state analog because that directly monitors our transition state, right? So the first thing we found that the transition state analog indeed binds 50 fold tighter for the great enzyme relative to the weak enzyme which agrees to the 50-fold increase in activity. So that's my, my, my last slide. Wh what happens here? The designer enzyme is like a spaghetti. The answer is in, in the ensemble. 
Yes, the act of confirmation is in there, but we have many confirmations which are which are confirmationally not ac accurate. And what directed evolution does, it increases the probability of the reactive species for the chemistry. Is there hope for design? Yes, if you hire Ricardo. So my postdoc looked at that and says, we don't need these 70 mutations. We need one other bad, what, there was one bad player. We got to remove this messianine and put the cysteine in. And if she makes, if she makes that mutation, you get a 30 fold increase in activity. So to summarize, and we will, I'm excited to go to the discussion after Lewis talked, take home messages, evolution took care of evolved functional proteins by caring about function equals dynamics. And all we need to do is take advantage of the built-in properties of these beautiful evolved proteins to um, make better drugs or use that knowledge to make um, better, better enzymes. Most important slide, that's my little, that's my team. They are the ones who do all this beautiful work. And I, I can't tell you enough how excited I always bring every day to come to work, to work with these talented grad students and postdocs. Uh, the only problem is they keep getting jobs. So if anyone who's dialing in is looking for an, and looking for on protein dynamics, uh, you can always go come, come to, uh, contact me to refill. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothea. That was so exciting. Um, I'm going to just uh, note, we have great questions in the chat. Please continue to post them there and we will take the questions after we go to Lewis. So I'll turn it over to Lewis. We see your screen. Perfect, Lewis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to be here, Liz. It's a, a pleasure for me. So what I wanna do is continue on from where Doro left off. I wanna talk about very highly dynamic systems and studying them by solution NMR spectroscopy. And I want to focus on uh, two areas today. The first of which is the study of molecular machines. So these are gonna be uh, protein complexes of aggregate molecular weights of many hundreds of kilodaltons upwards of a megadalton. And I just wanna emphasize that over the years, there's been methods that have been developed to preserve NMR signals so that megadalton particles can indeed be studied. And uh, they involve focusing on methyl groups. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna focus on methyl groups. We're gonna focus on particular experiments that allow us to look at these molecular machines. But these molecular machines have dynamic linkers. And so what that means is that although we can get some detailed structural information by common modalities such as crystallography and cryo-EM, Understanding in some cases how these machines really work requires looking at the dynamic regions that often are invisible in these uh, more uh, traditional methods for studies of molecular machines. And this is really where uh, NMR can come in and provide us with great insight. And then in the latter part of my talk, I'll speak about intrinsically disordered proteins and phase separation. These are highly dynamic molecules that uh, uh, are clearly important functionally and rely on uh, disorder and dynamics for function. So what Doro described today uh, in a nutshell, and this is obviously an oversimplification, is I have an energy landscape that you can see here. Uh, traditional methods tend to focus on the ground state of the energy landscape, but by virtue of the fact that the landscape is gonna be rugged, there's going to be populations of structures in the ensemble which are gonna be at higher energy and are gonna be uh, accessed uh, through the ground state uh, via uh, temperature activation processes. And so methodology really has to focus not only on the ground state, but also higher energy states. And indeed, as Doro mentioned, these higher energy states really provide another dimension for biology, where biology could be regulated through accessing these higher states that might only be populated at 1% or 0.1%, but nevertheless carry out a biological function. And then if you imagine this landscape and say we pull it apart a little bit so that we have this uh, schematic uh, indicated here, uh, and we have rapid interconversion between elements of the ensemble and we have low energy barriers, uh, then we might imagine uh, something that relates to disordered proteins or to dynamic linkers. And so we've got to have ways of being able to study uh, these uh, types of systems as well. And NMR spectroscopy is 
one of the ways that we can do it. So we're gonna use uh, NMR methods that have been developed over the last decade or so that allow us to look at megadalton complexes. And I wanna focus on one particular complex that is involved in uh, apoptosis. So apoptosis is the process by which 50 billion cells per human die per day. Uh, caspases play a major role in the uh, apoptotic mechanism and caspases are enzymes. If the enzymes are inhibited and you don't have apoptosis, then the number of cells that you have increases to levels that give rise to uh, cancers. On the other hand, if the caspases overreact and so you have aberrant cleavage, then you can get small uh, little uh, uh, cleavage products of proteins and that can give rise to various uh, neurodegenerative diseases. We're gonna talk about intrinsic apoptosis and essentially that's a process by which DNA damage or hypoxia or other stresses is gonna create a, a, essentially a bursting of the mitochondria. Uh, a cytochrome C is going to be released and it binds to a, a, a protein here called APATH1. This is about a 1200 amino acid protein. It binds cytochrome C, it also binds ATP and in the process forms a one megadalton complex called the apoptosome. And this complex, as you can see, contains these little uh, yellowish regions, these domains, which are going to be card domains, called card domains, and they interact with the card domains, the corresponding card domains here in black of caspase nines. So one gets card-card interactions that create essentially an apoptosome, which uh, is bound by caspase nines. And there's some mechanism that we want to explore today, which relates to the activation of caspase 9s. Caspase 9s, when they're activated on the surface of the apoptosome, are then going to activate caspase 3s, and caspase 3s are going to be the enzymes that then go forth and essentially start cell death by uh, proteolizing many of the critical enzymes in the cell. So the molecular players today are shown here. We have APATH1, which is 1,200 residues. It's a multi-domain protein comprised of a card domain, an oligomerization domain as well, nucleotide binding domain. And the oligomerization domain is going to be responsible for this beautiful heptameric structure that you see here. This heptameric structure was determined by cryo-EM, and it's really an outstanding example of the power of modern cryo-EM, you can get high resolution structures of megadalton complexes. And we can see the card-card uh, interactions that manifest by virtue of the uh, binding to the APAF1 card of the caspase 9 card. But if we rotate this molecule by 90 degrees, sort of exposing the uh, caspase 9 protease domains, there's a little bit of a problem. And that problem is that we can't see these protease domains. Now, clearly these caspase 9 protease domains are absolutely critical. After all, the function of the apoptosome is to generate a system that leads to proteolysis and that activates these caspase 9 protease domains. Uh, but by virtue of the fact of the 50 amino acid linker, and here's the caspase 9 player, there's a 50 amino acid linker between the protease domain shown here, and the card domain indicated here, uh, we can't see these protease domains uh, using uh, modalities like crystallography or cryo-EM. It's believed, in fact, it's known that the caspase-9 protease domains have to dimerize for activity, and then they uh, proteolize uh, caspase-3 to generate uh, an active caspase-3 molecule, which then goes and destroys many of the proteins in the cell. So clearly, the, the important question uh, is what are the protease domains doing on the apoptosome scaffold? And when you don't have information about that, you can uh, hypothesize a number of different scenarios. I saw one sort of scenario indicated here whereby activity uh, involves dimerization. Clearly you have an increase in local concentration of the protease domains when they're associated with caspase nines several of which are uh, bound to the apoptosome and that creates dimerization that then leads to uh, activity. So this is one hypothesis. Another hypothesis, which uh, need not be mutually exclusive, is that one has an interaction uh, 
with the protease domain and the body of the apoptosome, indicated here the scaffold, and so that interaction is shown in red, and somehow that interaction leads to an activation process. And so what we want to do by solution NMR is we want to uh, be able to distinguish between these two uh, possibilities, and we want to understand whether there is in fact dimerization of the protease domains on the surface of the apoptosome, this 1.3 megadalton complex, uh, and we uh, are going to do that by NMR. So the first thing that we looked at was to try to elucidate what the dimerization constant is for the wild type caspase 9 uh, molecule. So remember that caspase 9 is comprised essentially of two main domains. You have a protease domain indicated here, you have a card domain indicated here, and I show the alpha fold structures of the individual domains that are connected via a substantial linkers, for example, 50 amino acids indicated here. And we've looked at just the protease domain, or we've looked at the intact molecule. The results are essentially the same when one does, uh, say, calorimetric analysis to determine what the KD is. One finds that there's a weak association of uh, caspase 9 molecules, roughly uh, 5 millimolar in the context of the protease domain, 15 millimolar in the context of the intact molecule. So essentially, the monomer dimer equilibrium is heavily skewed towards the monomer. And we've verified that using other uh, technologies like SECMOLs. Uh, when one adds uh, an inhibitor or a substrate mimic, uh, then one shifts the equilibrium to the dimeric form. Uh, so adding inhibitor or adding substrate shifts the equilibrium to the 60 kilodalton uh, dimer. Now, given the fact that uh, in the cell, the concentration of caspase 9 molecules are on the order of tens of nanomolar, and we have, in the absence of substrate, a KD of roughly 15 millimolar. It's pretty clear uh, that in, uh, in cell, uh, we are going to have uh, caspase 9 existing in the monomeric state. So now we want to look at NMR spectroscopy of caspase 9. What I show here are, are spectra focused on the methyl groups. We're going to exploit uh, methyl spectroscopy and the unique properties of methyl groups so that we can study high molecular weight systems. The first thing that one has to do is one has to take every one of these dots and ascertain where the signal comes from. So that, for example, this dot here comes from valine 264, one of the two methyls of valine 264. And then we're going to use these dots as uh, probes of uh, molecular structure and dynamics. So what I show here uh, on the right-hand side of the panel is going to be four methyl groups that I'm going to be focusing on today. And in uh, blue and multiple contours is the spectra that we get when we have five micromolar caspase 9 protease domain. Now that's going to be a monomer in the absence of any substrate or substrate mimic slash inhibitor, and we get very nice spectra. Now, if we then add tenfold excess of inhibitor, the monomer peaks, these multiple contoured uh, dark peaks are going to disappear. You can see we have a very nice peak. This is a trace through the monomer peak. It disappears when we add inhibitor. We go to this uh, light turquoise uh, situation. The monomer peak disappears. And now we get a pair of peaks corresponding uh, to the dimer. So we have a dimer consisting of two protomers and the uh, magnetic environments of the methyl groups associated with these four amino acids is different in each of the two protomers, and that gives rise to a pair of peaks that you can see here. So we're going to exploit the fact that we can see peaks for the dimer and peaks for the monomer and ask questions about the monomer-dimer equilibrium of the uh, caspase 9 molecule, in particular the protease domains of the caspase 9 molecules as they dance on the surface of the apoptosome. And uh, we seem to have gone a bit far. And then the first thing that we want to do is we want to, uh, before we actually look at the apoptosome, the apoptosome is a very uh, big molecule. It's not something that we can produce in E. coli. We have to use insect cells. We can't use appropriate labeling that we typically like to use in NMR. So we thought, let's just take it slowly. Let's, in fact, look at an artificial apoptosome. And we're going to create an artificial apoptosome by looking at the proteasome. So the proteasome is a barrel-like structure. It's heptameric in nature, just like the apoptosome is. It's comprised of four layers. 
there's an alpha layer, a beta la layer, another beta layer, and another alpha layer. And it turns out through a mutations, one can produce a stable molecule that just is comprised of the alpha layer. So it's going to be heptameric, just like the apoptosome is, comprised of seven uh, repeats of an alpha subunit. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the alpha subunit and we're going to bastardize it a little bit. We're going to replace the N-terminal 17 residues with an intrinsically disordered uh, region called an ARC1P peptide. And then we're going to look at caspase 9. We're going to keep the protease domain, but we're going to replace the card domain with an SH3 domain. And the reason that we want to do this is because the SH3 domain and the ARC1P peptide bind with high affinity. It's roughly 0.1 micromolar. And so when we take our alpha that has been uh, substituted with an ARC1P peptide, and I call that alpha prime, our caspase 9 prime substituted with an SH3 domain, the prime indicates that they're not the wild type constructs. The alpha prime is going to spontaneously form this alpha 7 prime layer, if you like, and we can now bind caspase 9 to it with high affinity to create a structure that looks like this, which is about 500 kilodaltons in molecular weight, still uh, very reasonable for studies using uh, our NMR methods. Now, the reason that we wanted to look at this uh, alpha-7 mimic is shown here. Here I compare uh, the uh, artificial apoptosome, the proteasome-based artificial apoptosome with the actual apoptosome. But if we rotate the molecules by 90 degrees, sort of uh, face on, and we look at the uh, face that is projected to the caspase 9 molecules as they approach the receptor to bind, you can see that the dimensions are roughly the same, 120 angstroms diameter uh, for the mimic, 155 angstroms for the actual apoptosome. Here is the superposition. So we're going to use alpha-7 uh, as an initial uh, test of our system, if you like. And the first thing that we can uh, do is we can measure some uh, biochemical assays. We can look at substrate cleavage rate as a function of addition of our alpha-7 prime particle. And so what I show here is uh, cleavage rates. These are small substrates that contain fluorophores, which are going to be cleaved via caspase 9, the protease domain. And I look at the cleavage rates that we measure as a function of concentration of alpha prime relative to caspase 9 prime. So we have a fixed caspase 9 uh, prime concentration of a micromolar, and we're going to be adding alpha prime. Now, remember that alpha prime is going to form this heptameric structure shown here. So in the absence of alpha prime, we have a very low substrate cleavage rate. But as we add alpha prime, here we have a one-to-one -one, uh, mixture. You can see that the cleavage rate increases very significantly by many orders of magnitude, and it maximizes roughly at an alpha prime to caspase nine prime of two to one. So that corresponds to a situation where we have roughly three caspase nine molecules bound onto the surface of the apoptosome mimic. And then the uh, cleavage activity is going to decrease as we add more alpha prime. In other words, as we add more alpha seven prime molecules. And the reason for that is because as we add more alpha seven prime molecules, the caspase nines are gonna distribute among increased numbers of surfaces. And therefore the likelihood that we're gonna have two or more caspase nine molecules on a given apoptosome mimic is gonna decrease and we need to have dimerization in order for activity. And so if we look at the experimental results in green histogram, and we compare that with a, a mathematical model for binding that one can construct, whereby we uh, essentially measure the fraction of caspase nine primes that are bound to alpha seven, containing two or more caspase nine primes, which would be functionally active, you can see that the blue curve, which is the prediction essentially of the green uh, activity assay does a, a, a very good job. So we can now do the NMR experiment and ask the important question, namely, uh, what's going on on the surface of this apoptosome mimic is in fact the uh, protease domains, are they uh, forming a, a dimeric interaction? And so what we've done is simple NMR experiments, again, focused on the four methyl groups that we're using as probes of the monomer dimer equilibrium. We record spectra of just free caspase 9 prime, and then we add the uh, apoptosome at roughly, or the apoptosome mimic, at roughly a three to one 
a protomer to protomer uh, ratio. That's the ratio that gives rise to the uh, highest activity that we measured in the previous uh, slide, which showed the activity assay. So in blue, in single contours, is the APO form of caspase 9. And then in multiple contours in pink are the corresponding peaks when we add alpha prime. And we know, again, the caspase 9 is binding. But you see that there's absolutely no shift in the peaks. These are monomeric positions. And therefore, there is no uh, dimerization that is occurring. If we look at the position of where the dimer peaks should be, and this is indicated by the rectangles indicated in a dash line. And if we look at a trace through those positions, you can see that there's absolutely no signal whatsoever. So this monomer dimer equilibrium is still highly skewed uh, to the monomeric state. Now you might say, well, that's not the real thing. After all, you're looking at the mimic of the apoptosome and that's clearly the case. What happens if you look at the real thing? And so we've done that now, we can produce uh, the apoptosome uh, in insect cells, and we can then bind to it caspase 9, as shown here. Uh, the uh, available structures via cryo-EM suggest that there's a 4 to 7 uh, ratio, that's uh, protomer to protomer of caspase 9 to uh, apoptosome protomers indicated here. And this is a 1.3 megadalton complex. And then what we've done is cleavage uh, assays, just like we did for the uh, apoptosome mimic, we've now done that for the apoptosome. In the absence of the apoptosome, you can see the caspase 9 hardly cleaves substrate. But then once one adds the apoptosome, the cleavage rate very much increases, and it's maximal again at roughly 2 uh, to 1 uh, protomer to protomer ratios of uh, APAF to the uh, caspase 9. Now, note that the substrate cleavage rates are roughly the same both for the real deal, the apoptosome, and for the apoptosome mimic, roughly five or 600 arbitrary units. And the fact that we get similar activities, both for the apoptosome and the mimic, under, of course, uh, equivalent conditions of substrate of one micromolar, indicates that it's very unlikely that we would have binding of the a protease domain to the apoptosome surface to the scaffold, which is responsible for activation, because clearly these scaffolds are very different for the apoptosome and for the mimic. So it's not an interaction that occurs via the protease domain with the apoptosome uh, surface uh, with the scaffold. It must be something else that is responsible for the activity. So now what we want to do is we want to do NMR experiments, and we've done many of them, but I just want to cut to the chase here. We want to look at the surface of the apoptosome and see whether there's uh, a dimerization that is forming, uh, in the, again, in the absence of substrate. So what we have here, again, to remind you of the fact that the uh, apocaspase 9 is going to be monomeric. This is, the, if you like, the cartoon structure here. Here's the monomer peak. When we then take the caspase 9 and now add it to APAF1, to form a structure that looks like this schematically, the peak doesn't move. The peak hasn't shifted whatsoever, indicating that we have still a monomeric form of the protease domain. If we then add inhibitor, which is substrate analog, you can see that this peak now shifts to the position in the dimer, and we have two peaks, one for each iso uh, leucine 154 in the context of the two protomers. And we get the same thing even in the absence of apoptosome. If we had inhibitors, I showed you before, we get uh, formation of the dimer. And so the conclusion from this is that really what we have is the apoptosome functions as a concentrator of caspase 9 molecules. These molecules are not dimeric, even on the surface of the apoptosome, but they're situated in close proximity so that upon introduction of substrate, we can get dimeric structures that are then going to be active. There is not substrate-independent homodimerization, which is prevel prevel uh, prevalent in the literature. That does not happen in the absence of substrate, at least in our hands. And moreover, there are not special interactions that occur with the protease domain and the surface of the apoptosome, the scaffold, which somehow uh, lead to uh, increased activity. So now I want to change uh, topics a little bit. I've told you about a story that involves a intrinsically disordered region of roughly 50 residues that connects a, a protease domain with the scaffold and renders uh, cryo-EM and X-ray diffraction studies of the intact molecule uh, very difficult. But what happens if the whole system is disordered? And of course, 
that's even uh, more of a challenge for uh, modalities like cryoamma crystallography. And in particular, can we get out in the context of liquid-liquid phase separation that involves intrinsically disordered regions of proteins, can we get out animistic information which really provides us with insights into the mechanism by which a phase separation occurs? So by phase separation, I mean that we have a mixed state here, the sort of state that a, a typical biophysical uh, study might be conducted under. We have protein, uniform in solution. But if we then change conditions, which can be change the amount of protein or a post-translational modification, or change the pH or change the salt or add some sort of binder, we then can, uh, in some cases, generate a demixed state whereby we have the dilute phase coexisting with a condensed phase. In the condensed phase, we have a high concentration of protein. It can be upwards of 30 or 40 millimolar in concentration. And there are interactions between the individual molecules that are now condensed. And we would like to understand those interactions to understand what the driving forces for phase separation are. Now we need to have technologies to study that. This is important because 30% of residues in human proteins uh, are within intrinsically disordered regions of the proteins. And roughly 75% of intrinsically disordered regions uh, contain residues that are going to be charged. And we'd like to be able to understand the electrostatics on a per residue basis in an intrinsically disordered region of a protein to understand, at least for uh, the case of where electrostatics are important, how they might drive phase separation. Now, phase separation is not a new concept, and anybody who's in the uh, culinary business or who likes to eat salad with salad dressing recognizes the fact that oil and vinegar, a salad dressing phase separates. As you can see here, you have these blobs of oil immersed in a, in a sea of vinegar. And a similar situation uh, obviously occurs when you have protein and aqueous phase, when you have RNA and aqueous phase. But I think the idea that membraneless organelles concentrate proteins and nucleic acids and other uh, molecules, in particular small molecules, to regulate metabolism and biological function, and in so doing provide a bridge between cell biology on the one hand and bi biophysics on the other hand, that idea has really uh, become important and increasingly uh, understood in the last uh, decade or so. And again, it really does beg the question as to what the nature of the molecular interactions are that stabilize these biomolecules uh, in these droplets. And so what I want to do today is to focus on one biomolecule called Caprin-1, which exists with other molecules in stress granules. And these stress granules contain RNA in particular, high concentrations of RNA, but under conditions of uh, translational stalling, essentially when the initiation of translation is stalled, one generates these stress granules. Uh, and these stress granules, again, are made up of RNA and protein. We're gonna focus on Caprin-1, which is a 700 residue protein. And in particular, we'll focus on the C-terminal 100 residues. I'll refer to these actually as Caprin-1 that phase separate. Now, Caprin-1 is 15 arginines. It has a net charge of plus 13 at physiological pH. It is a very high PA. It is a very highly charged molecule. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, phase separation is going to have to require the addition of something to screen out all that positive charge. So if we look at the uh, intact Caprin molecule focusing on the last 100 residues, it's comprised of a, a series of regions. There's a pair of arginine regions at the termini, both the N and C termini, that uh, house the arginines. And then we have an aromatic rich region in the middle, which has a number of charges, but predominantly uh, is where the uh, aromatic moieties are gonna be focused. And like I said, we have a plus 13 charge. So to generate phase separation, we can do so uh, through the addition of ATP, through the addition of RNA, through the addition of salt. Here I show ATP induced phase separation, whereby we have our protein Caprin-1 affixed to it is going to be a, a pink dye. We have ATP, which contains a green dye. We have these blobs here that are imaged. These are going to be the uh, particles that uh, have phase separated. And you can see that the ATP and the protein co-localize uh, to the same region. Uh, so we have ATP and protein that is going to phase separate. We can also carry out similar experiments where we add sodium chloride to essentially screen charge. 
Uh, there's no phase separation under conditions where there's no sodium chloride. But if one adds 600 millimolar sodium chloride to screen the charge, we get these beautiful droplets indicating that there's phase separation. Now we can design a whole bunch of different NMR experiments that can address specific questions. And whilst I'm not gonna talk about uh, this particular aspect today, which deals with atomic resolution intermolecular interactions between uh, Capron molecules, I just really wanna point out uh, the fact that we can measure these. So that for example, if we have two chains of Capron one that are proximal, we have a black chain shown here, we have a red chain shown here, we can quantify the transfer of information from the black chain to the proximal red chain and get site-specific information so that we can design an experiment. And this is all done in the condensed phase whereby we look for the transfer of information. I keep saying that it's really a nuclear overhouse sort of effect, which gives us distance and dynamic information between in this particular case, side chain aromatic moieties and backbone amide hydrogens. That sort of data is indicated here where I show you a nitrogen proton two-dimensional map where the black dots correspond to the fingerprint of, of the uh, Capron one molecules. Each black dot is a backbone amide. So an NH, uh, an N15 and an amide proton pair. And then these red dots are basically the information that is transferred from the aromatics to the, to the NHs. And you can see that the red dots have different intensities. And so we can quantify how much information has been transferred. That is to say, what is the proximity of aromatics in general to particular NHs to get out uh, information? But the question that I want to address today is given the fact that Capron is so highly positively charged, can we measure the electrostatic potential of Capron? This is an unfolded protein. It's difficult to calculate electrostatic potentials if you don't have a structure. But can we measure via NMR electrostatic potentials of Capron molecules as a function of the trajectory towards phase separation? As we add, for example, salt or ATP, then when we have a phase separated transfer, and then when we go beyond phase separation, when we have uh, essentially the dissolution of the droplet, the reentrance phase, if you like, to the dilute situation. And so the first thing that I have to do is describe to you what paramagnetic relaxation enhancement is. The way that magnetic resonance works is that we have little bar magnets. These bar magnets give off magnetic fields. And then we spend millions of dollars to build a machine or to buy a machine to essentially record these little magnetic fields that are given off. Now, what we're going to do in nuclear magnet magnetic resonance is we're going to focus on the hydrogen uh, little nuclei, these little magnetic fields. But there are other sorts of magnetic fields, such as those which are generated from electrons. And these magnetic fields are going to be about 600 times larger. And so what we're going to do is if you have a system that has this yellow star here, i.e. an unpaired electron, a very big giant magnetic field, you can see it's uh, permeating from the star. This is what this red indicates. It's going to affect the NMR signal of these hydrogens that are in proximity to the star in a manner that depends on the inverse six power of the distance. So the closer the hydrogen is to the yellow star, the smaller the signal will be, and we can quantify that. So the idea behind these experiments that were pioneered by Iwahara and coworkers in Texas, and also by Marius Klor, who provided a lot of the background for these experiments at the NIH, is indicated as follows. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a number of co-solutes. We have a blue one, a green one, and a red one. These co-solutes are gonna look very much similar. They're gonna contain these black dots. These are the unpaired electrons. These are gonna be nitroxide radicals, proxyl uh, moieties. Structurally, they're very similar, except that one is positively charged, one is neutral, and one is negatively charged. And so the idea is that if you have a protein, where you have some positive charge, say at this end, and some negative charge at this end, and then you take a, a, a spin label, say it's a cationic spin label, then the cationic spin label is gonna be repelled by this uh, region of the protein, and the, conversely, the negatively charged, the anionic spin label is gonna be attracted. And by measuring the relative attraction repulsion of the different combination of spin labels, we can, using this simple formula that Junji uh, derived, we can calculate an electrostatic potential at each position in the molecule. 
We've done that for Capron. This is Capron in the absence of ATP, so it's before phase separation. And we get an electrostatic potential at each site measured in millivolts, indicated here using either orange or blue to indicate that we're taking different pairs of the spin label. Any two pairs can give us the electrostatic potential and they should be the same. And you can see that there's good agreement. Now, not surprisingly, what we see is that the electrostatic potential is positively charged. Not surprising because we have 13 positively charged uh, or a net charge of plus 13 uh, in this uh, protein domain. But what is quite interesting is if you look at the aromatic rich region, you can still see that there's a positive electrostatic potential of something like 20 millivolts, despite the fact that there's not that much positive charge amino acids in this region. Okay, most of the uh, positively charged arginines are going to be uh, domiciled at the N and the C termini. And so what that tells us, not surprisingly, we have an intrinsically disordered domain. We have delocalization of positive charge as these arginine-rich termini are going to move and essentially assume positions in proximity to the aromatic-rich middle region of the protein. So now what we want to do is begin our uh, ascent towards looking at phase separation. We want to add ATP and monitor how the electrostatic potential is going to respond as we continually add ATP before we get to phase uh, separation, during the phase separation uh, phenomena, if you like. And then if we add excess ATP and we have dissolution uh, or reentrance uh, into a, a, a dilute phase, into a mixed phase, if you like. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure turbidity these are turbidity of samples of caprin, several hundreds of micromolar as a function of ATP. Turbidity indicates light scattering, indicates the formation of phase separation, okay, the formation of these droplets. And if we expand this uh, region here, indicated by gray, you can see that we uh, have essentially no phase separation until about 0.8 millimolar. Then turbidity increases, it reaches a maximal uh, plateau at roughly three millimolar. And then it is uh, maintained, uh, the turbidity is maintained until about 40 or 50 millimolar ATP. And by 60 millimolar ATP, you have re-entrance into a mixed uh, solution. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to simply monitor, this is in the context of mixed solutions, the electrostatic potential is a function of increasing ATP. We're not going to focus on the condensed phase for a moment. What I show here in dark blue is under a situation where we have zero millimolar ATP. This is the data that I showed you before. If we then add 0.8 millimolar ATP to 300 micromolar caprin, not surprising, we're going to um, decrease the electrostatic potential because we're neutralizing it to some extent via the negatively charged ATP, a charge of three minus under the pH conditions we're working with. If we use the same amount of ATP, but we decrease the Capron 1 concentration, then again, we have more neutralization, but still positive charge. If we now add 90 millimolar ATP, so this is going to be, if you like, past the uh, condensed phase uh, situation, so we have dissolution into a mixed uh, phase, you can see that the charge has inverted the electrostatic potential is now going to be negative. Again, this is now, all of this is done in the uh, a mixed situation. And we now want to go and look at a demixed sample. So what we're going to do is we're going to add ATP to get a condensed phase sample. We're going to measure the electrostatic potential again. And we find the electrostatic potential, no matter what pair of uh, proxyl entities we use, proxyl molecules, the, the electrostatic potential is going to uh, be essentially zero. So the electrostatic potential is zero under the conditions of the condensed, condensed phase. Under the conditions that we use, where we have roughly 33 millimolar caprin in the condensed phase, we can also measure the concentration of ATP, a concentration of roughly 160 millimolar. So this is a bulk concentration of ATP of three millimolar that we add. But upon condensation, that three millimolar is going to go into a very small volume, the a condensed volume, to give a concentration of 160 millimolar. Now, as we uh, approach a situation where we get a condensed phase, as we decrease the surface charge, 
and therefore decrease the electrostatic potential, of course, the interactions between neighboring molecules should be increased. And we can study the interactions between neighboring molecules. And now we're gonna use an electron again. We're not gonna use co-solutes. We're gonna basically take this green molecule. This is a Caprin molecule that happens to be NMR labeled, N15 and C13 labeled. So we can do spectroscopy on the green molecules, but we're gonna add an equal number of gray molecules. They're gonna be Kaplan one molecules, but they're gonna contain an unpaired electron in the form of a temple radical that we're going to covalently attach in different positions onto the gray molecule. And so if you look at the so-called PREs that are measured, which indicate, quantify, the proximity of the gray molecule at the position of the electron to various uh, regions in the green molecule. And again, we can read out every backbone amide position in the green molecule. We can measure these intermolecular PREs as a function of residue number. Well, if we have no ATP, we have positively charged molecules that are gonna be uh, attempt to uh, be far removed. They're gonna be electrostatically repelled and we have no PREs, that's the dark blue. By contrast, as we add ATP, you can see that the PRE effect increases. This is the light blue. That indicates that these molecules are getting closer to one another by virtue of the fact that the electrostatic potential is decreasing from say 30 millivolts on average to 20 millivolts. If we then add 90 millimolar ATP where the electrostatic potential now inverts, but is only three uh, millivolts or so, you can see that the uh, molecules, the intermolecular effect it is going to be substantially larger. The PRE effect increases, meaning that molecules are going to come closer to each other. Now, we've measured this uh, interact these interactions through addition of our spin label all electron, if you like, the spin label at either the N terminus, the C terminal region, or in the middle. And you can see that the pattern is going to be very much similar. It may be scaled somewhat differently, but the overall pattern of the interactions is gonna be similar. And what that means is that whether you have a spin label here in the middle or whether you have a spin label here at the end, the nature of the intermolecular interactions is really going to uh, be very similar. So there's gonna be interactions that involve the aromatic regions with, of one molecule with the aromatic regions of another molecule and with the arginine regions uh, as well. Now we uh, can carry out a similar sort of experiment in the condensed phase, now focused on using sodium chloride to introduce phase separation to uh, limit uh, the uh, effective charge. And now we're gonna use 400 millimolar sodium chloride. We get phase separated samples. And now you can see that in contrast to the ATP generated uh, case where the average electrostatic potential is 0.2 millivolts, in the sodium chloride condensed phase, it's roughly six millivolts. So we have two condensed phases. The condensed phases are somewhat different by virtue of the fact that one sodium chloride and one is going to be ATP induced and that gives rise to different electrostatic potentials. Now you may wonder, well, if the sodium chloride condensed phase has an average electrostatic potential of six millivolts, and I've told you that at 90 millimolar ATP, you have an electrostatic potential, an absolute value of just 3.4 millivolts, so you have less repulsion. Why at 90 millimolar ATP do you have essentially the absence of phase separation? You have the dissolution of the particles, whereas at the sodium chloride case where you have a higher electrostatic potential, do you still have uh, condensed uh, material? And the reason for that is because ATP and sodium chloride are somewhat different. And ATP, of course, the largest difference is the charge, but ATP, the aromatic moiety of ATP is going to interact with the aromatic moieties of the Caprin one molecule. We know that because we can see that via NMR experiments. And so the interactions essentially between the ATP and the aromatic moieties of the Caprin molecule prevent the aromatic aromatic moieties of adjacent Caprin molecules from occurring. If you like, the aromatic that would normally interact with another aromatic moiety is now interacting with ATP. And as a consequence, we've decreased, as a consequence, we've decreased the favorable interactions that would normally manifest between aromatic moieties in the ATP case. And therefore, we have to reduce the electrostatic repulsion even more in the ATP case to get uh, phase separation. 
Now, because we have slight differences in electrostatic potential and six millivolts is not huge, but it actually creates very significant differences in material properties. For example, in the sodium chloride case, the concentration in the condensed phase is 19 millimolar, whereby it's 33 millimolar in the ATP case. That results in differences in translational diffusion properties of Caprin molecules. They're six times faster with sodium chloride, where one has a lower concentration of protein. And also the overall tumbling of the molecule has been decreased by a factor of three. This J of zero is just a fancy way of saying overall tumbling. So in the case of ATP, the molecules tumble more slowly as we would expect in a highly or more viscous environment that is associated with a higher protein concentration. Now you can look at the uh, tumbling, if you like, on a per residue basis for the ATP and the sodium chloride derived uh, phase separated uh, milieus. That's shown here in orange and in uh, blue, but in this linear correlation plot, you can see very clearly there's a beautiful correlation. And so what that means is that the interactions themselves in the different phase separate, separated milieus are not very different per se, but they're just scaled differently. There are stronger interactions in the context of the higher concentrated ATP sample. And these stronger interactions that affect translational diffusion and affect viscosity could well influence things like enzymology. And we have examples of that in our labs, my lab and Julie Foreman Kay's lab, but also others have noted that. And changing the viscosity can change other biological properties. So simply by changing the electrostatic potential by a few millivolts, one can change bulk properties that then affect uh, biology. And of course, these changes can occur via uh, simple uh, changes in the amount of RNA or ATP concentrations in Pone's translational modifications through the addition of phosphates uh, and so forth. So just to summarize, uh, we have in the case of Caprin, a highly positive electrostatic potential uh, system. We begin to add sodium chloride or ATP. In the case of sodium chloride, we get at 400 millimolar, we can form uh, a condensed phase where we have a slightly positive electrostatic potential. If we make a condensed phase with rather than 400 millimolar, 1200 millimolar sodium chloride, then we get a very dense condensed phase where the viscosity is much larger, the tumbling is much slower. In fact, it looks just like the ATP condensed phase and now the charge is essentially zero. So significant differences in protein concentration can be caused by electrostatics, and this can affect the mechanical and therefore the biological properties of the condensate. Let me stop there, but not before I acknowledge the people who were responsible for the work. The initial uh, work on the uh, CASPA system was carried out by very talented individuals, Reed and Alex, uh, and Enrico really uh, helped tremendously in the project as well, uh, and as did uh, another graduate student, uh, Nemo from Julie Foreman Kay's lab. The phase separation work was done primarily by Yuki and also by Atul, earlier studies by Taehoon, and all of this is a collaboration with Julie Foreman K. I thank them and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Lewis. That was absolutely wonderful. I think we've had just, uh, these two talks have beautifully illustrated what we were talking about, how NMR has this power to address really um, complex systems, you know, each system has its own answer and to understand what the interactions are and how we can understand how those change under different conditions. Um, it's beautiful. So thank you both. Um, I'd like to, uh, some questions can continue to be added to the chat. And what we want to do here again is have a discussion. Um, and one thing that, uh, that we had a discussion of Doro and Lewis and I, um, was we wanted to invite all of you to think about how can, um, going forward, how can you help? How can the frontier move forward by making these experiments ever more accessible? Um, so I might invite our speakers also to comment on, on how that could, their thoughts on that. Um, and I'm going to uh, perhaps, I'll let, uh, our panelists can also look at the questions. Um, and I do want to thank the people who are all posting the questions. 
So how should we start? Maybe we'll start with one from Dorote as questions are still appearing um, for Dorote's talk. So this is a, a rather specific one from Tucker Shriver. Um, and he asked about using tags and that some of the often the tags can be very bulky. What are the thoughts about other kinds of tags, like a dihistidine tag where you'd have histidine one turn along uh, in a helix to chelate cobalt, for example? Um, what are the prospects for tags? Yeah, um, great question, Tucker. So um, we have actually looked into a bunch of different tags. <laughs> And so if you look at our publication, we have actually described for the first time the dynamics of tags, including also tags which are used for fluorescence. So I think it's even more broader of interest, not just for NMR, but actually, uh, of course, for, for fluorescence. And it turns out that the, the, the tags we, a lot of people try to use, including the dihistidine ones, we had one which two cysteines as well, what happens that they are actually moving in millisecond time scale? So people keep trying to make more rigid tags, right? So the one you you, you alluded as well, the two histidines, we had one which also, you know, and this is really bad <laughs> because we're trying to figure out dynamics on the millisecond time scale. But if your if your tag actually moves on milliseconds, what you actually see is the moving of the tag. So we were that was our early approaches, right? Going after the what people in the field like to uh, develop more rigid tags. It turns out the opposite is better. Uh, tags where you just have an aliphatic linker, which tumbles isotropically and very fast, right? In you know in picoseconds or nanoseconds, because now you're averaging that out, which is actually also good for a um, single molecule thread, as you know, but for NMR. So you you want to have a tag which does not have millisecond motion. And so the tags we describe in our paper now are the ones going back to single cysteine, free rotation, right? Uh, so that all the motions we see is actually from the protein and not from the tag. But great question. And it, it was interesting because people have used these, these lanternite tags for a while for NMR, for solving static structures, it never looked actually at the dynamics of the tag itself, right? Uh, so I think that was really uh, um, useful for us. They not, there was another question about bulkiness, right? And um, that turns out to be actually not a problem at all. So I have used tags for both NMR and for FRED, and we actually have looked at whether the tag affects the dynamics of the protein. Because I was worried as well, right? Particularly if they're a little bulky, but also hydrophobic. And so far, that's it, we have never seen uh, that the tag really uh, influenced and negatively affected the dynamics. But again, I mean, it's something we were worried. And NMR offers this opportunity to directly measure. Because remember, we can measure the dynamics of protein itself without tag, right? So we can look at dynamics without the tag and with the tag. So that was uh, both for Fred also good news that really that uh, in many cases, uh, the, the the tag doesn't influence it. Can I just interject here? Uh, as somebody who's uh, tried to work with tags, I mean, of course we're, we're interested in similar sorts of experiments and we've looked at, as a starter, we looked at uh, the proteasome. The proteasome, at least the thermophilic version that we deal with is very stable and uh, amenable to uh, high temperatures, not surprisingly, and we tried to add tags in places that we thought would be uh, fairly uh, passive in terms of influence the influencing the structure. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, again, it's sort of, you have to be lucky, and maybe you have to be good, and maybe we were certainly not good and, and not lucky, but the majority of places that we decided would be excellent for putting our tags so that we could add our uh, our, 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 our metal turned out not to give rise to spectra that were amenable for studies. And so I think there is a little bit of a, of a black art involved in some of it. Um, I don't know, maybe you were saying, Doro, that you've had success with, with all the systems that you've looked at. So maybe I should ship you my proteins and you can just put the tags on and then ship them back for me so I can do the fun part. But, 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 you know, you look at the structure, right. And you say that this, you know, just like you showed that, you know, this amino acid should be responsible. Lo and behold, there were others that, that might've played a role in, 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 in some of your studies. I mean, how do you really decide 
except based on accessibility of particular region, surface accessibility, this is a good place to put a tag. Yeah, I mean, your tempo attacks were also worked, right? I mean, I, I do think uh, on a bigger picture um, for, you know, for the audience, I think you basically know need to know as much as possible about your system. So I always, you know, compare these projects. It's your little baby, right? So you you um if you really think try to understand the biophysics of your macromolecules you're studying, right? Uh, you have a better chance of designing your experiments, whether it's attack, whether it's um you know other experiments you're planning. And I think really just deeply thinking about your protein, looking at homologous proteins, thinking about functionally what kind of motion they have to undergo. We're taking all of that in, into, into account. So I think, I guess the good news is right now, we need smart grad students and postdocs. We need actually human, um, human knowledge to, to, to put this all together, to design, to increase your probability of successful um, experiments. So I think that's my experience. The more you know about your protein, the higher is the chance that whatever you design, whether it's a tag or something else, is, is going to work. So I just have to learn more about my proteins, you're saying. Back to and the drum. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting, right? So this goes uh, in direction to, you know, when we do rational drug design, right? So if you think about it, I mean, I saw my two biotech companies and it was like, why, why is our stuff working? And what I pushed the hardest right from the beginning is that we take care of our target, meaning the protein, right? If you think about it, if you would want to develop a drug, you're going to work on this that protein for 10 plus years. And the front loading of doing biophysics and figuring as much as possible out and having very clean samples, right, is paying off so big time. And what I saw is that there's too often a shortcut, you know, and you know, we are, we have some protein, we are, we are ordering it from somebody else who is making it for us, little quality control. So, so I think it goes in all direction. I think the better quality and the more you understand about everything about your target, the higher is a chance that you're actually not getting all garbage out in your high throughput screens and all these, all, all these other experiments you're, you're planning to do. Um, yeah, so, so I think that's my experience, that really take time to learn as much as possible about uh, your biomolecular systems. No, and I think that's... Louis, your, your example is great, right? Adding, mm -hmm. adding, adding sodium chloride, ATP concentration. I mean, right? So the, the role of additives, the role of buffer, the role of temperature, right? Salt. Um, I think this was a beautiful example when you, when you talked about it, of course, in this case, it was deliberately done to figure out when you make the droplets, but people miss, I mean, quite often forget that the system is not just the protein or not just the DNA or not just the RNA, it's actually plus solvent and everything which is in there. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that, yeah, I mean, you're certainly preaching to the converted. I'm sure there's not a single person of the 237 people that are now left that would disagree with that. In fact, an interesting anecdote, you know, when I started out my career, I decided that I wouldn't need a wet lab because after all, I mean, I could just get proteins and, 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 and do, uh, do, do whatever I wanted to with them. And, and now, it, you know, it's the case that people spend the bulk of their time in the wet lab work. So clearly being able to make things and understand things and, 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 and play with them in ways that you wouldn't be able to otherwise is, is absolutely critical for sure. Um, I'm going to follow up on this because it's it's kind of related. So in terms of um, doing these experiments that we need to do, uh, there's a question here from an anonymous person. Um, can we discuss the potential of doing these experiments on smaller magnets and how AI might help with doing these? I mean, it was sort of discussed to an extent by Dorote, but I think what you're saying is we still need our specific knowledge, but also we can complement with AI, right? Looking at all these sources of information that we have in the sequence that we don't yet understand or how things have evolved. Um, and I think that applies equally to, you know, to many different kinds of proteins, the more complicated with the disordered ones. But do you want to comment on doing these experiments on smaller magnets and the role of AI to- So maybe we, yeah. con con we divide it. 
So, Louis, you take the the answer of smaller magnets. I take the AI. AI you give me the hard part. <laughs> okay, so you go first. Okay, so yes, and that's why I'm very excited that there are still you know 200 plus people dialed in. Um, one of the things we really want to do, Louis and me, is to challenge and to encourage the people who are younger and smarter than us. Um, what is next, right? What are the next big steps uh, to um, to make a huge impact on understanding biological function and, of course, um, biocatalysis, you know, making better medicines and what and so on, right? Um, and of course, AI is, I mean, is very, very, very powerful, right? And what we're discussing and um, how can AI help, for instance, going to un to predict these energy landscapes that we don't have to do these experiments anymore, right? Go back to, to AlphaFold. The reason it works is because we had a lot of a big data sets. We had so much data of, of, of crystal structures, EM structures, right? And then of course, potentials, I mean, energy potentials. So what we are doing in the lab right now, and I hope my postdoc is not mad that I advertise a little bit, we want to build a big database for protein dynamics so that we as a community, actually have enough data, right? Again, to train, right? To do machine learning, to go to the more predictive way. And I think in order to do that is we have to come together as a community and figure out how to deposit data, how to do accurate data, data uh, um, uh, analysis in the, the deposits. And so I, I challenge all the, all the younger generation to really think about big picture and big steps. How do we share data? Um, how do we work together fast, right? Because AI relies on big data sets, right? And then once we have data sets, then, we, then uh, we're then we learning things. Now we have a predictive way. And what is it then again, the next step and on which levels? So I'm very excited about these, these steps because uh, we are in the data science age. And that's why AI takes over because we are producing a lot of data, but it's really milking the data and thinking about what kind of data we need, uh, which quality and how to work as a com community together. Right, so if I can just interject before I address the small magnet issue, uh, to have to use AI, as you pointed out, you need to have data sets. And certainly <clears throat> people measure N15 uh, relaxation properties out to wazoo. Uh, and I don't think that that's necessarily the data that you're talking about. You're also talking about the sort of data that you mentioned, whether it's relaxation dispersion data or assess data or data that uh, accesses slower timescale dynamics as well. And you're talking about uh, you know data that we have, which can de facto determine ensembles of higher energy states, low line excited states. They're still low energy states, but they're a few kcals per mole higher than the excited states. But we can probably count count on one hand, or maybe two hands, or maybe both of our two hands, the number of structures that at least people claim to have ensembles of higher energy states that are really out there. I mean, at an, at an atomistic sort of level. So those days, irrespective if we all agree that we're gonna deposit our data and be, you know, really um, kosher about, you know, or how we do the, the deposition so that people have all the data, there's not gonna be enough at the moment to be able to really train your data set. So this is why I'm excited about what you're doing with AI, where you can hopefully, you know, what your student or postdocs doing, looking at a whole bunch of different structures across the database. And then maybe one thing that we should do is, you know, in looking at your program, divide up and say, okay, of the gazillion structures that you have basically predicted are going to have alternate folds, right? Maybe you don't get the energy landscape too well because you don't really know the energies, the relative energies. Or maybe you do know them, probably not well enough and, and probably you don't know the rates, but that's where a group of people can come in, right? And put their samples into their magnets, big ones and small ones, and essentially measure relaxation, dispersion and cess. And you can do those experiments very quickly, you know, in a matter of six or seven hours. I mean, just to get a, to get a signature, to you know, a fingerprint, right? And then we can come back and say, okay, Doro, you know, you you guys were right seventy percent of the time, and here's where your predictive powers didn't work. But now we've got 
instead of 10 or 20 possibilities to work on, we've got 2,000 possibilities to work on. And if we did that, like sort of, you know, in the structural genomics uh, operatives of 20 years ago, um, where they were going to determine the structure of everything, if we set aside smaller goals, they even get excited states of 200 things, you know, maybe that would be doable. Uh, and that would then give us the predictive capabilities to then turn it around and let machine learning do its thing. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I think that what has to happen is again, coming together of really people thinking very creatively about different kinds of data, what the, what, so the obvious one, the obvious ones are always the obvious one, but there's no more information in data than what we have milked. Okay. So I think it's coming really having people thinking creatively what NMR data, what electron densities actually entail, right? What what I mean, a lot of that stuff, what we did came actually from evolutionary ideas that the uh the substates, right? If the substates are essential for, for biological function. There has to be evolutional pressure on these substates, and those substates are actually real structures, right? And so these are the contacts, the 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 atom the the atomistic contacts which need to be conserved, kind of, right? Uh, it's it's not as obvious as the ones which are fully conserved because we are talking about conservation of motion now, right? But at the end of the day, it's in the sequence, right? A lot of information is in the sequence. So I think having people coming together who are way smarter about AI and machine learning and all these different algorithms together with people who understand, for instance, proteins very well and understand uh, the, the what 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 all the data we have, I mean, what's in the data, basically. And so what you said, Louis, what other data, very importantly, would be important to produce? I mean, people like to do omics, right? Uh, you know, people do these alanine scanning. People love to do thousands of whatever alterations and take a lot of data. But the guidance of what kind of data that would actually be most useful, the questions we want to answer, I think is also an, an interesting discussion, right? Because if you do 99% of the experiments over here, but you would need to, to cover these other things and you don't take those data, it's no, no, no good. If you have a thousand data on this point, but not covering the areas you need, right? So I, I, to me, it's mainly the creativity of students and postdocs thinking about what kind of data we should produce for machine learning. Right, so, you know, I, I wish I had a dollar, well, maybe $10 or $100 for every example of every protein that is supposed to have, you know, dynamics in a range that I can then apply methodologies to so that I can look at excited states atomistically, right? And you put it in the magnet and you see nothing. Now there may be dynamics on a different time scale. There may be dynamics, you know, or the kinetics aren't right, or the, the whatever. It, you know, it 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 doesn't work. And and of course we're studying only a very few proteins, and and we're we're sort of doing it blindly. And that's why I just think that you know for NMR, if we just focus on NMR for a moment, because we're both NMR centric, you ask the question: Well, what? How are we going to approach looking at? excited states. I mean, they're, they're going to be probably some form of relaxation dispersion experiment or some form of relaxation experiment, you know, magnetization exchange experiment like SEST or DEST or, or something like that. I mean, there's a limited number of experiments. And I just think that you could plow through a lot of systems very quickly. Now, they may not be biologically relevant, everyone, but I would say at this stage of the game, it doesn't matter because they're going to give us information about how the dynamics is encoded in sequence, and in particular, the relevant dynamics that are then going to enable for NMR to go out there and to get the information that will allow you the chemical shift differences, whatever, to get out these excited state structures. And so I think if we just did sort of a broad screening, uh, obviously not thousands, but, but you know, tens or maybe a hundred, we would learn a fair bit about the encoding of millisecond timescale dynamics in sequence, which ultimately then could be transferred to these computer machines, which can do a far better job than we can. That, And it may be that you now have the technology, Doro, through your yeah. 
postdoc with being able to screen and to say, okay, here's 50 structures and you won't be able to do them all, but here's 50, you know, that look like they could be interesting, right? Because right now I'm just taking a structure and throwing it in my magnet and typing go. And that's not very satisfying. Yeah. But, but again, you touched on it. I think in this big data science area, I think we have to work together better. Sharing ideas, sharing data. I mean, we just had another example. I don't want to go into detail, but I mean, we put our AI method on BioArchive, okay? Because we want that everybody else is using our AF cluster on their systems. That's the whole idea. We cannot do everything ourselves. And it worked, you know, other labs used it, came back to us. Oh, it works now in our system, we, you know, and whatever. And then there was a lab that used our stuff, which we also want to further develop the method, right? But they would not sh share their data or their code. We make our code available, that lab did not, right? So I think we have to share code. We have to share right away data so that we are faster and not waiting until finally, you know, we get it published in a, in, a, in a journal, right? So I think it was a really exciting example for me, how I mean, early on putting something out and sharing a code is actually helping, right? And I see a lot of questions here, by the way, in the, in the Q and A's, we will not get to all of them, but what I would want you to do is because I don't know when, when this thing gets closed, I probably will probably don't be able to see it. So one possibility, that two possibilities, either you, you stay on and we're typing or you send us an email with your question because the one thing I really, really want to make sure that we get to answer all of your questions, right? Uh, and so I'm very open to this discussion that we actually discussing, you know, your specific questions, but also how to work as a community together, right? Because it is, we are in such an exciting interface right now. Um, we have a lot of data, we have, you have, still haven't addressed the big magnet versus small magnet, but uh, the, the idea is we have a bunch of magnets in the world, right? So we should be NMRs behind, uh, I think, to produce more data, which we can use, right? Uh, but also in these simulations, we should use much more of the computational part as well, right? Um, so anyway, for all your questions on the, on, on this chat, um, Elizabeth, what, we, what do we wanna do? Well, we're, we're at four o'clock. So, um, and I think that actually you've, you've gone big in these questions and I agree, there are so many specific, really important questions that we actually really need to dig into to continue to push the frontier. Um, so I think I will, I think I will suggest, what do you want to do? I'm happy to stay a little longer. Luca says we can. We well, can I should probably answer the question that I sidestepped because I was so- yes. uh, do it, um, do it, one, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, yeah, and then please, everybody who where we didn't answer the question because this will disappear and we can't see it, can you just shoot us the emails with your question and we'll just answer. Yeah, and you may want to also, I mean, I'll answer Doro's questions and she can answer mine. That might be, that might be interesting. I mean, sort of an exchange. Uh, <laughs> but getting back to small magnets. Uh, so I think, you know, it, Obviously, um, you'd like to have a number of magnets to perform experiments uh, on, but but I think the answer is that you, depending on the application, don't necessarily have to. For example, if you have a single magnet and you're doing a magnetization uh, exchange experiment like chemical exchange saturation transfer, uh, you can change the B1 field, uh, the, the, the field, the, the very weak field that you're using to actually probe for the position of your invisible peaks. So essentially in that experiment, what we do is we look for seeing the invisible. Doro's given you an example with CPMG. If the time scale is somewhat different, but uh, maybe not so different now since we've done assessed on CPMG timescale uh, systems. But if your timescale is amenable to assess, then what you can do is you can apply a very weak field which goes in search of, of the, the, the invisible peaks that are associated with your uh, excited state. And you can certainly do that uh, in a B0 independent manner. That is to say, if you have a 500 or 700 megahertz spectrometer at that field, but you simply change the 
wheat field that you're using to explore uh, the chemical shift landscape in terms of where those uh, excited state peaks resonate. So you can certainly do a lot of work at a single uh, field and there's been beautiful work that's been done by people who just have, have a single way. In connection with AI and analysis of data, I've had the great pleasure of working with Fleming Hansen on some of that. We have CEST experiments, for example, that give line shapes that people don't like to look at. Um, but machines don't mind looking at them and they can take line shapes that look a bit funny and they can turn them into line shapes that look beautiful and they're cosmetic to the human eye. We've used AI to train uh, uh, those particular systems. I mean, I think the power of NMR is that we understand the spin physics to such a great detail that we can generate literally, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data sets with as much noise as we want for training. That's easy to do because we understand the spin physics associated with every one of our experiments to enough detail. And so we can, in terms of the experiments, we can train our system. And what that means is that we can design new experiments that allow us, for example, to perhaps minimize certain delays in the experiment where NMR stuff happens and again, get a, a spectrum that looks funny, but we can reconstruct it using artificial intelligent methods to get a normal spectrum, if you like, in terms of appearance, but just one that has twice or five times the sensitivity. So there's no doubt that right away that AI can make a huge contribution uh, to spectral quality, spectral appearance, um, you know, we can take, uh, as Fleming Hansen has demonstrated, uniform C13 labeled proteins. We can record carbon spectra. There's carbon-carbon couplings. We can essentially make them disappear because we can train machines into recognizing that these multiple peaks come from essentially a single peak and we can uh, simplify the spectra. So the spec from a spectroscopic perspective, we're there and we know how to generate tons of data. So I think really the, the next step is going to be going forward to, as Doro says, being able to get enough data so that we can train um, the next generation of AI to look at not the lowest uh, level on the energy landscape, but um, sparsely populated, but nevertheless important higher energy states. So I want to add to that question of magnets, right? So I don't think that the bottleneck is magnets. Um, there are national facilities, right? And I want to encourage people not NMR experts to really take advantage of that. So I think one direction we want to go, you all are very, very passionate about your systems, right? And you want to throw everything at kitchen sink, NMR, crystallography, right? You know, if it's big or EM uh, and uh, computation. And I think we want to, what we have to go to that we have those facilities where those pulse programs are optimized, you know, their staff people are really, really skilled on um, running those, right? So that what you need to learn is, of course, how to make a good sample and then how to do the data analysis, which actually, you know, is much, much, much easier to learn. But we have enough magnets in, you know, in Europe, in the US, and quite a few of those are not heavily used, right? So I think the, the, you know, already with, with crystallography, that's why it works so well. We have we have the synchrotones and everybody's using it, right? I think NMR, EM is going in this direction as well. But yes, we need people like Louis Gate, you know, pushing the envelope and developing new methods. And you definitely need several magnets on, on hand. But for established, 90% of the work we do is, is establish pulse programs, right? We need a handful of people like Lewis to, to, to push the elephant, but then we want to use those pulse programs. And the more people are using it, Lewis, the more data we produce, right? And so I think this idea of remote data collection at national facilities is the most cost-efficient way to do it. Uh, and you don't need a megahertz. I mean, almost everything you can do it in on 800, right? So this pushing to higher fields and higher fields for, for very specific uh, applications you need it. But for many other things, you know, the workers magnets work really well. Um, so uh, I, I really think it has, it should become more and more one of the techniques people who are interested in biology are using it on their systems. That's what I want to see. I agree. And complementing it with all these other types of information we know so that we can really get at the full time scale of everything that's important in all these different systems. Exactly. And, and I just want to reemphasize really 
what's what 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 I just love about Solution NMR, you can do anything in your tube. And you know, you can go from zero degrees all the way to 90 degrees. You can go at the temperature where the organisms live. You can add your substrate, you can add your inhibitor, you can add your binding proteins. You can manipulate so many things. And of course, life happens at temperatures, ambient temperature, right? And so there's great there's great excitement. I heard a talk about EM where they're trying to now go up in temperature and freeze again and so on. But you know, with cryo EM, you're at cryo, right? Uh, we do now things where we can do crystallography up to 80 degrees. So we push that uh, development in my lab uh, in, in collaboration uh, that we can actually do crystallography at higher temperatures. But if you want to understand biology, right? I started with saying that the energy comes from KT, from temperature, right? And we all know life doesn't exist below the glass transition, right? So that's one of the big powers of NMR that we are in solution and that we are at these temperatures where organisms live. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we have actually some great suggestions here too in the in the chat that people are are saying how to continue this dialogue, and I'm encouraged at, at the great participation here. Thank you to our audience for being here, for engaging in this, and I know you will continue to take us forward. So um, we'll and share. It looks the, like the somebody chat. says here, make a Discord channel. I thought Discord channel, send the email list so everyone can see the questions and answers and follow the discussion. Yes. Do you know how uh, that works? I will ask Raluca. I don't, I'm not the person who can make that happen. I'm whether in order to do that, whether we have to stay on, on that Zoom one. I don't know. What well, no, she's, I've asked her to save everything. I'm busy sending messages alongside here. So yeah, we're not going to lose this. Yes, yeah, so we can we, we cannot lose those questions. And That's the right. That's right. And I think if we could make it in a way that everybody, whoever wants to see it, can dial in and see the question and answer, that would be best. Well, I will answer one more thing, which is, of course, this, this uh, webinar is going to go on to YouTube. Uh, so others can continue to um, view it and we can add to conversation and maybe we'll also post things on our um, website, on the Protein Science website to continue, Society website to continue to uh, explore this because this is our mission. We need to understand all these things about proteins. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dorothy and Lewis and Raluca and Shannon and all of our uh, participants. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. You. And I hope a lot of people got excited to go and have creative ideas to make big, big, big leaps in science. <laughs> okay. okay. On that positive note, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>